Our next speaker is, is Jonathan. Are you there, Jonathan? I'm here, Magnus. How are you? Oh, great. I'm fine. I'm almost like this is why I wake up in the morning because I love those events, as you know. So can we can you share your yeah? That's right. Here we go. You got it. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Yeah, it's coming. Excellent. And we can hear you and everything is fine. So just take it away. Totally good. Well, look, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here um, at this thing's eBazaar. Uh, what you can see before you, uh, I, well, let me say, I work for Universes. I'm the CEO at Universes. Uh, and what you see before you is uh, is the cityscape. And the, the, we have a bunch of vehicles in that city and they're colored yellow. And the reason they're colored yellow is because Universes writes software to process data from sensors on board those vehicles to give them what we might broadly describe as perception capability. So that typically that's cameras on board these vehicles. So it's all about computer vision. And we solve three problems for those vehicles as they operate in the city. We infer where they are in the, their position in space as they drive around the city. Uh, we use the, the, the data from the cameras to measure the 3D structure, the 3D geometry of the vehicle as it travels through the city. And you can see from the, the name of the title, the autonomous future, that actually that helps autonomous vehicles understand where they can navigate and where they can go. Uh, and uh, the third problem we solve is actually understanding the semantic nature of that 3D structure. So as a vehicle drives through the city um, and it spots a lump of something on the side, what actually is that lump? Uh, is it a park bench, uh, in which case it's probably going to stay still, uh, or is it a dog, in which case that, that dog might run out in front of the vehicle, and the vehicle needs to know about that. So Universes does a lot of work with autonomous vehicles, um, and we, we work with companies like Zensiact, who are a wholly owned subsidiary of Volvo Cars, companies like ABB, uh, with mining robots, um, and uh, other companies as well who do that, do that sort of thing. But what we're starting to do now is take all of our computer vision technology and squeeze it down to run on a smartphone. And when it's on a smartphone, we can put that smartphone into a vehicle that's operating, that's already operating in the city. A taxi, a bus, a garbage truck, that's already out there anyway. We put our computer vision technology that measures those things I talked about, the position, the 3D structure, and the semantic nature. And we turn those vehicles into data harvesting agents. We're not trying to make them autonomous anymore. We're just trying to run our computer vision to get data about the infrastructure in the city to help manage the city infrastructure in a better way. So we use computer vision essentially as a sensor, a mobile sensor on these vehicles through the smartphone to get data about the city to manage the city infrastructure in a better way. So we're starting to do this already. We have uh, um, smartphones out on taxis here in Stockholm. We're starting to work with Helsingborg in the south, putting smartphones on garbage trucks. Uh, and then we're, we're starting to work with taxi fleets in Zurich uh, and uh, expanding as we go, delivering data to the different cities and municipalities to help them run their uh, cities in a better way. If the sort of thing we can detect and infer, um, is, this is the tip of the iceberg, we think, but it's all sorts of different features. Really, a camera is a very rich modality of sensing. And actually, the key thing is that you produce the software to automatically process those images and extract the features to help manage the city in a better way. Um, you, you can read all the different sources, but crucially for this talk, I wanted to focus on the infrastructure. So this is where we've started, um, to keep focusing on road damage, where there's potholes and cracks that need to be mended. Uh, it's a big problem for the cities to know where those are, that those problems are so that they can uh, send the resource to the right place. Traffic signs, another piece of infrastructure that needs to be monitored, and they have very little idea about how to do that. And then roadworks is a particular problem for everyone, but uh, again, um, we, we can detect that using our computer vision and then uh, assign, um, inform the cities about where they need to go to inspect those roadworks uh, and ensure that the, the contractors are complying with uh, regulation. Uh, we can also detect other features, um, vehicle traffic, pedestrian traffic, parking spots, where there's snow and ice that's fallen that needs to be cleared. But as I say, for this particular topic, I wanted to stay with the, the infrastructure because we're focusing around smart infrastructure and particularly focus on roads. And I just wanted to illustrate how big this problem actually is, just so you all know. Uh, actually, this is the 1.7 billion pounds. This is the cost of automotive repairs in 2019 in the UK attributable to damaged roads and poor road conditions. If that's the equivalent here in Sweden, again, this is a number from 2019, 928 million sec going into automotive repairs caused by damaged roads. So it's 
big, big, real big cost to this problem. That's the annual road budget in the UK where I'm from. Uh, just recently in 2019, they actually had to add an extra 100 million just because there were so many potholes. So potholes are just this, this huge problem, actually, that uh, I'm the first point to understanding where they, uh, uh, solving them is understanding where they are in a smart, scalable way. The equivalent problem in the US, everything's bigger in the US, it's three, three billion, um, actually that's dollars, not pounds, I put the wrong symbol there, but it's three billion US dollars per year is actually, they estimate the cost of these potholes and what they're causing. And crucially, actually, the thing that's really important about this is actually if you can find these potholes quickly, they, they cause less of a cost. And so any pothole that you get, if it costs $100 to repair one year, actually, if you don't get it, it can be up to seven times cheaper in, in the next year. Uh, and so the crucial point is to find these damages soon so that they don't expand and get worse over time. So there's a real potential cost saving to finding these problems in a smart, efficient way. And of course, it's not just about saving money. Actually, about a third of the deaths, uh, road road related deaths in the US are attributable to poor roads. So it, it's not just a, a potential cost saving. There's actually a real uh, human cost as well. And actually, this is the, the, the what's been estimated in 2019 again. There's a socioeconomic cost in Europe of having bad roads. So uh, you know these are huge numbers. These are huge problems. And the first step is to uh, assess these roads in a cost-effective, scalable way to understand what's happening, so that we can uh, attribute a resource in a better way. So here's what we're doing in Stockholm. Uh, this is the smartphone running in the taxis. This is out there now. We're detecting all the different types of damage. This is using deep learning by to the computer vision. And then we're forming an aggregate assessment of the road that you can see here uh, up in the top left-hand corner. We're just putting on a, on a scale of what naught to four, which is how the road inspectors do this at the moment. Uh, they go out and they drive around and they visually inspect the road. Instead, we're doing the same thing with a smartphone. And so suddenly we get the coverage increases the accuracy increases and the efficiency increases. And then of course we populate all of that onto a map uh, and we can put the hotspots onto the map uh, and uh, the, 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 the darker the red spots, the worse the damage, the higher the grade of, da of damage. Uh, and then the city uh, understands where the problem is and they can send the resources out to repair it. So that's uh, happening now in Stockholm as we speak. Uh, then I mentioned the other one I talked about was traffic signs. Um, there are about three, uh, three or five, between three and five million signs in Stockholm. The reason it's such an inaccurate number is because they just don't know. They have no idea what signs are out there and indeed what state they're in. Uh, they get about 8,000 damage reports a year in Stockholm, but that's just from concerned citizens who have really spotted something that's really, really bad and they report it in. Um, they actually have no idea how, how bad it really is. And they, they, there's been cases where it's been taking them 10 years to actually find a bad sign and do something about it. So this is a real problem. They, they have no idea what assets are out there, what state they're in, uh, and what they need to do to sort them out. It's not just a Swedish problem. In Germany, a recent survey found that about a third of the signs are unreadable. Um, and then in France as well, they, they estimate almost as much as half of the signs are just uh, about live their lifetime performance. So again, it's a, it's a a large problem in terms of scale. So, so uh, universities are starting to try and address this again with the same smartphone technology. Um, here, uh, we are putting a smartphone onto a vehicle. This is some work we completed for the Swedish Road Transport Authority uh, traffic verkit. Um, and here we're detecting speed signs. That all happened very quickly. So I'm just gonna go a bit slower frame by frame. The smartphone images, and this is processing happening out on the smartphone. We're detecting the speed signs there. You can just see the bounding boxes going around the speed sign. Because we know our position, that's the red line, we can then triangulate the position of those speed signs. So we were able to see the sign in multiple images and then triangulate its position relative to our position, relative to the smartphone position. And that means we know where the position of the sign is and we can place it in a map. Uh, and then the Road Transport Authority can go and look at that um, overview, that image, click on the little sign and get a recent image of it and understand what state it's in. Uh, if it needs to be attended to, if it's correct, actually start to build an inventory even. This is some other work we did uh, to detect the number of hazard signs on roadworks. Uh, it's a slightly different problem, but it, 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 the contractors need to put out a certain number of signs per unit distance. And so we're able to now do that with a smartphone, count it for them, report back to traffic circuit if the contractor is complying with regulation. So that's just two specific examples of how we're using computer vision technology on a smartphone 
uh, mounted on vehicles traveling around the city to monitor infrastructure in a smart way, to help understand what's happening in the city, to help deploy resources more effectively and help make the city a safer and happier place to be. I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening to me. Well, that's great, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll see if I have a question for you here. Uh, Jonathan, I guess your customer for this would be Traffic Kultur to Traffic Workers in Sweden and the international counterparts. Are you working with this type of actor today or are they slow in using the efficient source of data? I can imagine that getting new technology in can be cumbersome to fit into existing purchasing processes, etc. So we are actively working with Traffic Verkit, with Stockholm Start, uh, with Helsingborg Start, and some other cities. But your point is absolutely true. They, the way they procure technology is slower. Um, uh, we are at the moment, I think, experiencing something of a renaissance within that uh, particular field. There is a strong urge and drive to digitize processes. The whole smart city wave, if you like, is uh, is really um, taking a sort of a hold across Europe and cities are looking at each other to kind of understand how they're each working to digitize to make themselves smarter. So actually there's a real appetite for this kind of technology. And the thing that's really lovely about this is not only does it provide data that's really useful and interesting and, that, and provides insight into what's happening in the city to help save money and make things more efficient. We're also doing it in a cost-effective, sustainable way we're making, there's no special capture vehicles. We're just taking advantage of vehicles that are already out in the environment anyway. There's no special hardware. It's actually just a smartphone. If you talk to many cities, a lot of them have uh, contracts with um, telecoms operators to provide phones. Most of the people who work at the cities have old phones left over in their drawers of their desks. If we can persuade them to make use of those old phones, putting them in the, vehicle, the municipality vehicles, in the taxi fleets, suddenly we get actually just making better use of uh, hardware that we already have available today. And that's a really powerful message, I think, for these government uh, entities to take forward. Jonathan, what about GDPR when using ordinary cameras? Yeah, that's great question, expected. of course. Sorry? That was expected, I guess. Yeah, I know, absolutely great. It's a great question, of course. Um, so so uh, the, most of our process, all of our processing takes take place out at the edge on the phone. So when we capture an image, we process it, and then we send the location of the pothole uh, or the location and type of the traffic sign to the cloud. So, so no, no, mostly speaking, no image data is transferred to the cloud. We do uh, transfer some images to the cloud, firstly for confirmation purposes. So when we, we you saw that when you detect a traffic sign, uh, you can then get a picture of it. Uh, we run those images through an anonymization pipeline. It take, blurs out faces, it blurs out license plates, uh, and so we remove any personal data. Um, uh, we also collect images for training purposes, of course, to, to refine our software. But uh, as a result, we don't actually store any personal information. Uh, I should say that even though that is the case, we are GDPR, GDPR compliant, we have compliant. We have our privacy policy on our website. Um, we conduct... Um, we have data processor agreements in place with our counterparts who collect data with us, uh, data processor impact agreements, impact assessments as well. So, so we, we've gone through the paperwork process, even though we are not collecting or retaining any, um, any personal data simply because of this perception. Actually, we've got cameras out in the public environment and we want to be totally clear with everyone. We're not collecting personal data. We're collecting information about the city, to help manage and run the city in a better way. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jonathan.